Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be reading in verses 5 through 13 as we talk today about small talk. That's the first time in seven weeks that you guys have heard me say a passage other than Ephesians 6. I didn't like the tone I heard there, Randy. Does anyone here watch talk shows? Raise your hand if you watch talk shows. I'll tell you what, I used to love to watch The Tonight Show. In fact, I would probably still love to watch it if it didn't come on after my bedtime. But it does. The talk show, or excuse me, The Tonight Show, I found out, is actually the world's longest running talk show. This Thursday's episode where they had Rose Byrne and Brad Paisley, was episode number 12,198. 12,198 episodes of The Tonight Show. That's pretty impressive. As soon as I heard that, I thought the same thing that some of you are thinking right now, so I've got the answer for you. Our our 12,198th service assuming that we don't have to cancel for inclement weather or anything like that, will be on Sunday, July 27th, 2251. So mark your calendars down for Sunday, July 27th, 2251, which coincidentally will be my 274th birthday. I'm really looking forward to that day. That's going to be exciting around here. But back to talk shows. My favorite part about the talk shows is actually what they do before they do the real reason that they're there. So we all know the real reason that these celebrities go on the talk shows, and it's because their publicist or their agent has booked them there to promote whatever it is they have coming up. So maybe they have a new movie coming out or a new TV show or they've written a new book or they're going to do a a concert tour or have a new album they're releasing. They are there to talk about whatever it is they're trying to build hype over. But for me, that's actually when the interview gets boring. I'm like, yes, Tom Cruise, I know you have a new movie coming out. I'm going to go see it. You don't have to talk about it. Let's get back to the fun stuff. For me, the fun stuff is what they start with, which is the small talk. They'll talk about their kids or their pets or something funny or interesting that has happened in that celebrity's life recently. Basically, whatever they think the viewers will find interesting. And I love that part of the show because it makes me feel like I know the celebrities. It makes me feel like we're friends. But the reason why the talk shows do that, the reason they start with small talk, is to have a way to start the conversation. Can you imagine if Tom Cruise had gone on The Tonight Show two and a half weeks ago to promote the new movie, Mission Impossible, And Jimmy Fallon had said, well, Tom, you have a new movie coming out. Tell me about it. It'd be kind of boring, right? That's not a way to start a conversation. It also would have put Tom Cruise in an awkward position of trying to figure out how to say something that would be interesting to people. So instead, Jimmy asked him about some things that were going on in his life, and they talked about Top Gun, and and it got the ball rolling. It started the conversation. And that's why we use small talk in our daily lives as well. Because we've all learned that if you don't know how to start the conversation, sometimes you just don't. Have you ever sat in the other in another in a room, excuse me, with one other human being for like 30 or 40 minutes and not said a word? Like in a doctor's office? Have you ever been to a doctor's office waiting room? I remember. A couple years ago, Christina had to go in for some tests, and and they were pretty serious. So instead of her just going, I went, and but you don't go back for the test. You sit in the waiting room. And another husband was there doing the same thing. His wife was having a test, and we literally sat there for 45 minutes or more and didn't say a word to one another. Only two guys in the room, and we pretended the other one didn't exist. The reason why is because we didn't know how to start the conversation. I mean, that's not a time when you're like, so how's your wife? And what we've learned is if 
If you don't start the conversation, then sometimes you just don't have the conversation, and then you miss out. So why are we talking about this here today, this morning? The reason why is because there's an area where I believe that many people don't know how to start the conversation, and so they just don't. And that area is prayer. Can anyone in the room relate to this? Is there anyone that that sometimes when it comes to prayer, you're like, I just don't know how to start the conversation with God. I think that there are three main reasons that that people run into this. The, The number one, I think some people are just confused. They just don't know. They don't know how to pray. They don't know what to say to this being that they've felt but never seen. Maybe this is you. Maybe you're new to church or new to Christianity. Maybe you've never been taught how to pray. So all that you really know of prayer is what you've seen in movies or on television. And that is not a healthy picture, just so you know, of prayer. I think in the church in general, we do a poor job of teaching people how to pray. I think sometimes we forget that not everyone was raised in church. Not everyone went to children's church and Sunday school and was taught how to pray. We just expect new believers to know what we know about prayer. Christina and I learned this lesson a few years ago. We started working with the Hispanic youth group at our previous church. And we started pastoring them, and we would have a small group. And one day after that small group, I said, okay, well, who wants to pray before we leave? And they all just kind of sat there and scared at me or stared at me with this look on their face like. And then finally, one of them, more of a leader of the group, spoke up and said, "Um, we don't know how. And and I was oblivious to this as a problem. And I said, sure you do. (laughs) Like, yes, you know how to pray. You just you just pray. You say, dear God, thanks for this awesome class. Let us have a good week. Amen. I mean. But they didn't know how to pray. They didn't know how to start the conversation with God. Maybe you're not in that group. Maybe you're not in the confused group, but you're in the overwhelmed by prayer group. Guys, I can tell you honestly, I can't remember how many times I've sat down and I've I've been having my quiet time with God and I get through with reading the Bible and then I'm like, well, God, It's me, and I don't know where to go next. And it's not because there's nothing to say, because there is so much to say. But I get overwhelmed by it all. Earlier this year, I tried something new. I'd heard that other people were doing this and were successful, so I decided to start a prayer list. Does anyone pray from a prayer list? Like you have a a written list, Linda's. I started this. I said, you know what? This this will be awesome. This will help me organize my thoughts and make sure that I'm that I'm not forgetting to pray for anyone or anything, and, and it'll be awesome. So I sat down and I, I started writing out all the names of my family that I needed to pray for. And then I wrote down the names of some of my friends, and I wrote down the names of every person in our church. And then I wrote down the names of other ministers who were, who were friends of mine. And, and then I was like, okay, well, let's talk about the church. And I wrote down, you know, church finances and, and that will make an impact on the city and that you'll give us favor with the mayor. And so I wrote down all these requests. And I just kept writing. And any, anything I could think of that I needed to pray for on a regular basis, I wrote it on this list. Let me tell you, that may work for you. And if it does, great. For me, it was terrible. Because I looked at that list, and there was no way I was going to get through that list in a day or even a week. In fact, probably not even a month. Here is, I decided to bring it out here with me. This is page one of that list. There are four more just like it. It was crazy. There was, there was no way I was going to accomplish that. And it overwhelmed me. Some days, I'm not even kidding, some days I would just put my hand on the list and say, God, you know. Because if not, it was like I was an auctioneer. I was like, Lord, help Brian, Christina, Courtney, Justin, Beth, Anna Kate, Will, Lynn, Jean, Rose. And I wasn't really doing any good. I mean, I was. I was praying for those people, but not very specifically. I decided to 
to move away from the list and just pray for whatever I could remember to pray for that day because I figured if the Lord would put it on my mind, then that's probably what was most important. But some people just get overwhelmed with prayer. And then there's a third group. Those are people who are disappointed. And there's two main ways I think that people get disappointed in prayer. Number one is they get disappointed in themselves. Maybe you forget to pray for a day or two, and then, and then that turns into a week. Maybe that week turns into a couple weeks or a month. And then when you realize, man, I haven't spent time with God in a really long time, and I'm always in a bad mood, and nobody wants to be around me. Well, then you feel disappointed in yourself about not praying, and, and so you don't know how to start the conversation again. And some people get disappointed with God. Maybe he didn't answer your prayer request, or maybe he answered it in a way that you didn't like. So sometimes we get disappointed with God, and we decide that we don't want to pray anymore. So we don't pray again. Today, I want to tell you whatever group you're in, whether you're confused or overwhelmed or disappointed or something I didn't even mention, I want you to know that God's waiting for you to start the conversation. And I want to challenge you to do something today. I want to challenge you to start the conversation with God. For those who are saying, well, Pastor Brian, that's a whole lot easier said than done, I want to tell you something. No, it's not. It's not easier said than done. Let me tell you how easy it is to pray. I saw a video a while back of this couple who was driving through a storm, and they were were hauling a new camper. You guys may have seen this on Facebook. I think I even talked about it before. But but in this video, the, the conversation that was going on between the man and the woman would lead one to believe that maybe they weren't churchgoers. And... When the storm, the, the tornado came, and it actually, it actually tipped their truck over and did a lot of stuff, and that woman who was in that conversation yelled out, Oh, Jesus, please forgive me. She remembered really quick how to pray. It's not easier said than done. You just need the right motivation. So we're going to spend some time over the next couple of weeks. Like I said, we may have a missionary here next week if that works out, but But for the next few weeks that I'm preaching, we're going to spend some time looking at prayer. And we're going to find out why it's not easier said than done. So I want us to jump into the Word. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. And I'm going to be reading from the God's Word translation. Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They stand in synagogues and on street corners to pray so that everyone can see them. I can guarantee this truth, that will be their only reward. When you pray, go to your room and close the door. Pray privately to your Father who is with you. Your Father sees what you do in private, and he will reward you. When you pray, don't ramble like the heathens who think they'll be heard if they talk a lot. Don't be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, let your name be kept holy. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread today. Forgive us as we forgive others. Don't allow us to be tempted. Instead, rescue us from the evil one. Now, before we get into what that text tells us directly, I want to hit on something really quick. Did you notice how Jesus began that passage? What were the first three words? When you pray. Jesus didn't say if. He said when. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that Jesus just expected us to pray. He expected us to know that that was going to be a part of our life. It wasn't if you do this or if you decide to do this. It was when you pray. And Jesus wasn't talking to pastors or teachers. He wasn't talking to the disciples. This is actually part of a passage that's referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. 
Jesus was talking to hundreds of people. So I want you all to know that prayer is for you. It is for every single believer. You don't need a priest or a preacher to pray for you. Now, we do, and the Bible tells us several times to pray for one another, but it also says to pray for yourself. Jesus even told his disciples to pray because the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. Pray that you might be stronger. Pray that you might be able to stand. So now that we know that prayer is for every believer, I want to begin this series by answering a key question, and that is, what is prayer? What is prayer? Guys, this one is so easy that I'm literally not going to use Scripture to tell you what it is. I'm not going to use a dictionary. I'm not even going to do what I usually do and tell you what the Greek word is and what the Greek word meant. Although it's a combination of two words that mean to and then wish or desire. But we're not going to get into that. I'm just going to tell you in plain old English what prayer is. Are you ready? Get ready to write this down. This is going to blow your mind. Prayer is talking to God. It's that simple. Prayer is talking to God. And it can be as simple as now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Such a morbid prayer to teach kids. Or it could be God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. I don't know who thought good and food rhymed, but they don't. It could be as complex as our dearest heavenly father, maker of heaven and earth, ruler of all things. I knoweth that thou art a merciful God, righteous and just in all thy ways, forgiving sins and calling others. So on and so on and so on. Or it could be something like, hey, God, as you know, I've got that test or that doctor's appointment or that interview or that meeting coming up, and you know I'm really not looking forward to it, God. Please help me with that. You know how much I hate those, and I really, really need you. Prayer is just talking to God. And I think it's important for us to remember that. In a minute, or actually in the next sermon, we're going to look at a template that Jesus gives us for how to pray, for things to include in a prayer. And that template is very important, and I'm glad that Jesus gave that to us. But even if you don't remember that template, you can still pray because prayer is just talking to God. It doesn't have to be in the king's English, and it doesn't have to be the same every time. In fact, I encourage you to not let it be. I'm really glad that we have the prayers that we can teach children so that they can know how important prayer is. But I've noticed as I've gotten older that sometimes we write our own prayers repetitive prayers that we just say over and over. And it becomes something that's not real. It becomes just going through the motions. So I would encourage you to not make it be the same every time. Can you imagine if every conversation that you had with your best friend or your neighbor or your wife or your husband or your mom or your dad or your kids, if every conversation you said the exact same thing, I feel like Christina does that. (laughs) That was not in the notes, and I should not have said that. It'd be kind of a weird relationship, though, wouldn't it? If every single time you talked to someone, you said the exact same thing. So why do we do that to God? That's not what prayer is about. Prayer is just you talking to God however you decide to do it. So if the what of prayer is talking to God, let's talk about the how. How do we pray? This is where we get into our text. And like I said, Jesus gives us a really cool template. But before he does, he gives us two important instructions for how we should pray. 
And the first one is this. Be real. Be real. In verses 5 and 6, Jesus says, When you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They like to stand in synagogues and on street corners to pray so that everyone can see them. I can guarantee you this truth, that will be their only reward. When you pray, go to your room and close the door. Pray privately to your Father who is with you. Your Father sees what you do in private and he will reward you. To help us understand those two verses, I want you to understand something about Jesus. Jesus is always concerned with the heart. Look, all through Scripture, every interaction that Jesus had, it's he is concerned with the heart. See, this isn't so much him telling you don't pray outdoors or don't pray in public. Make sure you're inside with the door closed. It's about why the hypocrites that he talked about chose to pray in the streets and in the synagogues. He's saying, don't be that guy who wants to show off how fancy he prays. That's what Jesus is saying. And he's saying, if you do, then you just got your answer. Because what you wanted was not to have your prayer answered. What you wanted was for people to see you, and it happened, so there you go. Have you guys ever watched the presidential prayer breakfast or like the, the national day of prayer in Washington, D.C.? Have you guys ever seen that? They, they have these ministers that will come up, and, and I'm sure they all mean well, and, and it's probably nerves and everything. I don't want to talk bad about those guys. I'm not doing that. But they'll walk up to the podium, and they will open up their notes and read their prayer. This is what I think. This is a passage that I think about when I see that happen. In fact, I got blessed with the opportunity to be one of the five ministers that, that were involved in the Lowell National Day of Prayer that, that we did. And, and I was like, I told Christina, I'm not going to write down a prayer. I'm just, I'm just going to go up there and pray. And it may sound silly and stupid. It may not be as eloquent as the other guys, but that's what I'm going to do. But then I realized that you don't have to write down a prayer and read it to just be going through the motions. You don't have to write down a prayer and read it to be doing it for the wrong reasons. This is actually one of the reasons that I almost always ask somebody else to pray if we're at a church event. I don't like being the guy that prays all the time. And when you're the preacher, like, and you go, like, and you hang out with people who are not preachers, you're always the one they want to pray. It'll be time to pray for somebody who's sick, and they're all looking at you like, well, pastor, do you want to? You go to Chili's, and you're like, I just want to eat my burger. I'll pray if you want, but you can pray just as well as I can. Jesus says, keep it real. Don't pray for other people to hear you. Pray so that the Father will hear you. Number two, he says, get to the point. Verses 7 and 8 say, when you pray, don't ramble like the heathens who think they'll be heard if they talk a lot. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Don't ramble. The King James Version says, don't use vain repetition or meaningless repetitions. Now, to understand that, you need to understand a little bit about the culture that, that Jesus was talking to. So the heathen religions in that time they would, they would do these repeated chants or prayers. And, and it actually got so bad that they felt like that if you went on longer with your repetitions or louder with your repetitions than everybody else did, that the false God you were praying to would answer you instead of them. That's the, the culture that Jesus was speaking into when he said, don't ramble. Don't go through vain repetitions hoping that your God will answer you. He says, thinking that you'll be heard if you talk a lot. Now, Jesus isn't saying to be quick with your prayers. He's not saying, you know, God's busy, make it short. You know, you got five seconds. What he's saying is God isn't focused on your word count. God's focused on 
the heart behind it. And I love that Jesus chose to say this, and here's why. Because first, he just got through talking about the hypocrites who would stand on the street corners or in the synagogues and would pray loudly so that everyone could see them, who would try to impress everyone around them with their prayer. And as soon as he got through saying that, and he said, go in a room by yourself and close the door, he says, and there, don't try to impress God with your fancy prayer. Think about it. He told them, when you're in public, don't try to impress people with your fancy prayer. And then when you're in private, don't try to impress God with your fancy prayer. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about how ludicrous that is, that we'll try to impress God? Some of us will try to impress God, and, and, and we don't realize, like, he's the guy who made the whole world and everything in it. But even worse than that, we're trying to impress the guy who saw us yesterday. The guy who saw us lose our temper and yell at our wife. The guy who saw us hit our hand with a hammer and say a curse word out loud. We're trying to impress the guy who saw us yesterday fall into Satan's trap for the thousandth time. Trying to impress him with our prayers. Jesus says, don't use meaningless repetition to try to impress God. Get to the point. Tell God what's really on your mind. Another way to say this might be, be honest with God. Just be honest with God. Now guys, I'll tell you, this is a weird week because it's almost like we're right in the middle of a sermon. Like, like if I didn't care about your time and, and my time and we didn't have food coming right now for our meeting, then I'd go on for another 45 minutes. So it's like we're in the middle of this sermon and we're pressing the pause button. But I don't want you to leave here not having the opportunity to put something into action. So here's what we're going to do. I want to challenge you not to wait for the next installment of this series to start the conversation with God. In fact, I want to challenge you to do it right here and right now. Now, some of you are offended. Like, how dare you tell me to start the conversation with God? Preacher, I'll have you know I already prayed this morning. Good. You can continue the conversation. I don't care. But I want to challenge you to start or continue the conversation with God using what we learned today. 